praise God. Wherever you are this evening, just lift up your hands and worship God. Worship Him for another beautiful time in His presence this evening. Worship Him for His God, for His good. Thank Him for his, your salvation. Thank Him for the life that you live in Christ. The Bible says it is in Him that we live, we move, and we have our being. Thank Him because in Him we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Appreciate Him from the depth of your heart and with so much intentionality this evening. Thank Him because He's here to speak to each and every one of us this evening. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you're going to be unveiled to us in another dimension. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you are breaking strongholds this evening. Thank you, Jesus, because you're here with us. Thank you, Jesus, for clothing us with your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for encapsulating us with your presence this evening. Thank you, Jesus, because we know that you're here with us. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're set to do amongst us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels pause straight forward. Bring forth the royal tidem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal tidem and crown him, Lord, and crown him, Lord of all. If I were you this evening, I would lift up my hands to my Father. I would lift up my hands to my Father and call him sweet names. Oh, lipa la ba zikete ya balada zikete la ba yana mana kazi akatai. Oh, King of Glory, abakati libra zikete ya the King of Zion, the Lion of Judah. That is who you are, Jesus. Leke libra zikati la ba na mana zikete ya la ba da ba da ba da kasatari ya la ba. Lida da da na mana zuzu zikete ya la ba ya da ba zikete ya la ba da. Hey, la ba yana mana zikete ya la ba ya da ba zikete ya ba ya. King of glory, we worship you. King of glory, we honor you this evening. Oh, let's take you one more time. Oh, heal the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate forth and breathe.
to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who joins us online every Sunday evening. God bless you. Let us say a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the transforming power of your word. 
Lord, as we look into this word that scripture calls the perfect law of liberty, we ask for revelation and knowledge. We ask that this service is revelatory and that by this revelation we experience transformation in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we've been on the series for the past five weeks now. I think this is the fifth week of the series. And I think I have, um, from what I see, I think I have this, maybe this week and next week we'll wrap up. Or at the most, this week and another two weeks, we'll be able to wrap up songs of redemption. Glory to Jesus. So finally, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. We're finally in Revelation 5 now. Amen. (laughs) For those of us that have been following the series, you know I've been talking about Revelation 5 over and over again. So I'm finally there. And I'm going to actually compress the teaching so that we can finish in about three weeks. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's see Revelation chapter 5. And um, I said last week, when I was ending last week, I, was, I said that I'm going to be talking to Russ about, um, about four events that have um, a relationship. Glory to Jesus. Four events that explains each other, that supplies additional information about what was happening in that context. We're talking about songs of redemption. So let's start our reading today from the very first verse of Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. We is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Look, or behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the, 20, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them apps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9 which is where I got the theme for this teaching from. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Praise the name of the Lord. Did you follow that conversation? Now, let me, let me start to say a few things. Let me start by saying that the Revelation is a very interesting book, all right? It is full of several imageries, several allegories, and some literal um, narration of events. Some of the events are literal narrations. Some are imageries. That is, they are symbolic of other realities. And some are allegorical. Praise God forevermore. But the, the key to understanding Revelation is in the very first verse of the book. The Bible says, this is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Let's read it so that we don't, you can see it by yourself. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Did you see that? Did you see that? So, it means that the things that John was going to narrate in the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation are not just events in a sense, but they are the revelation of the Christos. They are revelations of Jesus Christ. Are you getting the point? So, it means that we must understand some of the narratives in that book from the paradigm of the person of Christ. Praise God forevermore. This is not to say that Revelation does not have a predictive element. Because there is a predictive element in Revelation and that prediction actually starts from the, the chapter immediately after what we are considering. We now began to see the horsemen and the trumpets and then began to explain the significance of the trumpet. And then later in the chapter, it began to give... Um, a sort of treatise about the end of times, all right, what we refer to in theology as eschatology, which is the study of the end of times. How is this world going to come to a climax? How is this world going to come to an end? Revelation um, puts forth a treatise about that, which is all part of the visions that John, the beloved apostle, saw on the island that is called Patmos. Praise God forevermore. However, like every prophetic revelation, um, it takes a deep prophetic understanding to be able to come to a precise knowledge of the timelines of the revelation. What I mean is that there are certain things that um, John wrote in the book of Revelation that were speaking to current events in his days. For instance, when you read Revelation chapter 3, and John began to write a vision about the seven churches in Asia, and then he was talking about a lukewarm church, he was talking about another church that was a standing church, you know, Philadelphia, he was talking about the church in Sardis, the Tyatra, and all of those things. Those visions were actually visions of churches that were churches in his day. Are you getting the point here? It's just like if I wake up today and say this is the revelation of God to the redeemed Christian church of God. Do you know that for all of us that are alive now, we know the church I'm talking about, right? Because it was a present church. But in those days, they did not have denominations. They had congregations of believers gathered per location. So I can say this is the word of the Lord to the church in Ogbomosho. It is what um, John writes and said this is the word of the Lord to the church in Tiatra. Tiatra is a location in present day Turkey. Glory to Jesus. And so John writes God's word to those churches. That already tells you that the fulfillment of that prophetic word had already happened because it was in John's day. Do you get the point here? But as New Testament believers, those words are still written for our own instructions. Glory to Jesus. So we can still learn, we can still imbibe um, the messages that are put forth in that revelation and it still has applications to our life today. Glory to Jesus Christ, because the word of God is new every morning. What I've just tried to explain is that some of the words of prophecy and vision um, put forth in Revelation were present-day reality to John. Some of the other things that John wrote about were things that were going to happen in his immediate future. There are certain events that are recorded in the book of Revelation that has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. You find the same narrative in the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. When Jesus began to speak about the destruction of Jerusalem 
and Bible scholars and theologians have found out that that prophecy was actually fulfilled in the year AD 70, that Jerusalem was actually destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Glory to Jesus. There are also certain events that are recorded in the book of Revelation that speak to the far future. Can I announce and say to us that, some of, that today we are living the reality, some of the realities that John spoke about? Hallelujah. We are living in some of the realities that John spoke about. I don't have time to begin to show present day fulfillment of Bible prophecy today, but it will just alarm your heart when you begin to see how accurate the scriptures are. However, the last thing I want to talk about which is the emphasis of today's message, is that some of the things that John also wrote were account of events that had happened in the past. So what we see in Revelation chapter 5 is actually an, the account of an event which happened a few years before John had this vision. Hallelujah. And I'm going to connect it by showing us four related events, which I alluded to as I was trying to wrap up our teaching last week. Are you following this here? You see, if you've ever moved in the prophetic before, you would understand, and God is raising prophet from amongst us, amen. If you are connected online, I declare that your prophetic graces are sharpened right now. In the name of Jesus, see things that ordinary eyes cannot see. Perceive what ordinary men cannot perceive. I cause that your ears are open to pick the sound of heaven in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you flow in the prophetic, you will realize that certain times, it happens to me a lot of time when I have to do prophetic meetings. Um, that's why the Bible gives room for what is called the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. The word of knowledge many times picks information about people's past. So I can say, Hey, sister, for example, you have three brothers. Is that correct? She says, yes. Now, me saying she has three brothers is a foregone fact. She knows she has three brothers. Do you understand? It is nothing new. Now, sometimes you pick that past thing, and then the donor begins to tell you things about the future, beginning from that previous information. Somebody get on what I'm saying. So it could be that the prophecy is supposed to be about one of the brothers. But you have to first pick the fact that there were three brothers and this and this had happened. But then the Lord is saying concerning this one, do you get the point? That's how the prophetic moves and operates most of the time. So what we see here in Revelation chapter 5 is John picking a prophecy of what had happened before and then from the from the revelation of that past event begins to prophesy about the future which is hinged upon this event that had happened. Do you get the point? So it begins to talk to us about an event in heaven. When you follow that narrative, it's an intriguing narrative. The Bible says that John began to see a scroll in the hand of he who sits upon the throne. Which by understanding we know is the Father. Amen. So there was a scroll in the hand of the Father. And John says that an angel proclaimed with a loud voice. That we is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals. So there was an announcement in heaven. That there are certain things that have been encoded in these scrolls. And we need one person that is worthy to be able to break the seals, open the scrolls, and read them. And, you know, if you are a first-time reader of the scriptures, you'll be like, okay, what's happening here? And then John now begins to say that he started crying because there was not one found who could break the seals. Then, if you are a first-time reader, you now begin to wonder, ah, what's so important about this scroll that you are crying that no one was found? And why is nobody found? John, began, John wrote very specifically that no one was found in heaven or on earth who was worthy to break the scrolls. My God. The scrolls must be, must be very important. Such that 
it, take, it took a certain capacity, a certain standing to be able to be the one to break the scroll. And John says, I could not find any, they could not find any rather, in heaven and on earth, who was worthy to break the scroll. And on, on account of that, he was crying. That means that the breaking of the, of the scroll was so important to his life that he knew that if we don't find anybody to break this scroll, to break this seal and open the scroll, I am doomed. That's, that's what could make a man cry. And it was not just important to him, it was important to all of humanity. And then he says, one of the elders said to him, stop crying. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Watch this. We follow a narrative of a scroll be, need, being needed to open. Glory to Jesus. I think I just spoke wrong English there, but you understand. So there was a need for a scroll to be opened and the seals broken. And then we found out that there was no one who was worthy to be able to break the scroll. And on account of no one being available, the Bible says that John began to cry. And then the next thing we saw was that an elder called his attention and said, see, somebody is worthy. Glory to God. So he says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David, Kai. Maybe before the end of this series, I'm going to explain the significance of the Christos being the lion of the tribe of Judah and being referred to as the root of David. It's very significant. I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably explain it before we get to the end of the series. Not today. Are you following me? He now says, what's this? He didn't just come, hey, glory to Jesus. You already see where this is going. He didn't just come to break the seals and open the scroll. The Bible says that he had prevailed. That means that he could only have the right standing to break the scrolls because he had done something. Are you following me? So there means, it means that there must have been an engagement that had happened prior to this time in the heavenlies and this person that is referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David must have fulfilled the prerequisite. He must have come out triumphant in that engagement. For scriptures to now come and say that the, he has prevailed, all right, and then he's, he can open the book and lose the seven seals. You see, a, a serious student of the Bible does not, pre, does not speed read. So you now wonder, so how did he prevail? That's why I said there are about four events that come to play in this. The first event is the event that we spent time talking about last week on the Mount of Transfiguration. Glory to Jesus in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1 to 5. Um, you don't need to open them. I explained that already last week. I'll just allude to it. That Moses, who died and his body was not found, came to have a conference with Jesus. Elijah was also there. Elijah did not die. He was transported to heaven. And I said that he had several layers of revelation. One of it is the redemptive dimension, right? I explained that Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophet, and both of them have come to tell us that the Christos is the preferred. So the law and the prophet are says, yeah, the son, right? And there's also the impartation dimension. Jesus was about to go into an engagement, and he needed, as it were, the grace upon Moses to die and his body not found. Remember, on the third day, when Mary ran to the sepulcher of Jesus, she came back feeling sad because she said, I have not seen my Lord. I don't know where they put his body. So Jesus needed, as it were, 
that grace from Moses to die and yet be alive because his body was not going to be found. And upon his resurrection, so I believe that Jesus took resurrection from Moses. Are you following me? But then that was not the end though. There was another engagement that needed to happen. He needed to ascend bodily into heaven. Are you following the point here? People who go to heaven go with their spirits. Their bodies remain on earth. But Jesus needed to go to heaven with his body. And the only man that scripture records expressly that did that was Elijah. Remember that story where Elisha had to cry out, my father, my father, the horsemen of Israel and the child thereof. So Elijah went into heaven bodily. So Jesus had to also get that impartation. Why was it so important? I'm going to show us. That Jesus had to go into heaven bodily. Do you know that Jesus went to, if you study your scriptures very well, you will realize that Jesus went into heaven twice. Someone's wondering, really? I will explain. You see, the Bible is an amazing book and you'll be amazed at the clarity all right, if you can just study gradually. Are you following my point? you get there. We'll get there. So I've explained the matter of transfiguration, right? Then on the cross, in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished. I am showing you how the root of David prevailed. Are you getting the point here? It is finished. That means that he, he says that now I have paid the price for your sins. But guess what? His assignment was not over. If Jesus just died, yes, he had died for our sins, right? But he had to resurrect. The work was not done if he didn't resurrect. Hallelujah. That's why when Jesus died, remember the Bible now says that if the prince of this world had known, he would not have crucified the king of glory. Because actually, Satan thought that the killing of Jesus would be at hand. He did not know that the divine agenda was that he must of necessity taste death for us. And that, let me explain this. Do you know that Jesus is the only person that died? came back from the dead and is still alive forevermore. Hallelujah. That's why at the tomb of Lazarus, he introduced himself as a resurrection and the life. Every other person, in my opinion, were just resuscitated. Because they died, we raised them up later, they eventually said, Kukuma die. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even because raising of the dead, raising of the dead is a very fantastic miracle. By God's grace, I've seen the dead raised once in my life. Glory to Jesus. But I've tried it many times. And we yet see more. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Glory to God. I, why did I start talking about this? I will not fall into the temptation. Because I know some of the story. But I've tried some things though. Going to mortuary and to open the fridge. We want to raise the dead. You have to be daring with the gospel. Amen. Be daring with it. Listen. If, somebody, if they call me again, I will see go. Because it is until you do that you can do. Did you get that? It is until you do that you can do. As long as you have not done it, you have not done it. Ah, uh, uh, me, I'm still praying. Mm -mm. You have prayed enough. Do it. You will never know how much you carry until you attempt the miraculous. Make a conscious decision in your life to be a consistent practitioner of the miraculous. And let me, let me quickly say this as an aside before I continue this. That, listen, the reason why many of us are afraid to practice the miraculous is not humility, it's pride. We don't want to be seen as the people that did it and failed. <laughs> Can you see the point here? So, when you bring a cripple now, and I say, it's really fell lay hands on the cripple, get the person healed. What is happening in your mind many times? It's not that you don't believe that Jesus can heal the cripple. It's that I wonder, hmm, if I go and do it now, and it did not happen, what will they say? You, it may not be playing in your mind literally like that, but that's what is happening in your subconscious. 
Can I tell you the truth? It's because you think you are the performer. The pressure is on Jesus, it's not on me. The person that has a name to protect is Jesus. Also. Because he's the one that says I should lay hands. And if I lay hands, they will be healed. I've done what he asked me to do. If they don't get healed, now Jesus no healed them, no be me. Do you understand the point here? We must have that childlike faith in the ability of God. That he says, do it. I have done it. He is the one that has an integrity to protect. Do you get the point here? I'm just trying to help. I'm just being a yielded vessel. And I have noticed that people who are dead in the sense that they don't have any re- reputation to protect are the ones that God consistently uses in the miraculous. One of the things that prayers and study of the word does is that it helps you to see less of yourself and more of the Christus. Hallelujah. Did you get that? So, how did I get into this? Talking about people that came back. Jesus is the only one who rose from the dead and is still alive forever. And I was saying that, listen, if he died and he didn't resurrect, the work never finished. In fact, Satan's goal was to keep him in the grave forever. When Jesus died, all of the hearts of hell, glory to Jesus, came to hell. There were, those three days, there was no demon anywhere in the world. Though. <laughs> the, the agenda of every demonic spirit was that this one, we don't catch him. He must not be allowed to resurrect. Are you getting the point here? So they tried as it were to say, we will keep you down. Hallelujah. That's why Revelation, I'm already showing you the parallel. That's why Revelation says he had prevailed. Meaning that there, it was a war. It was like there was a war in hell and he prevailed. Hallelujah. Did you get that? He prevailed. The Bible now says, having spoiled principalities and power. Do you get the point here? So he, spoiled, he defeated the oath of hell in the grave. And he spots them of their possessions. What are the possessions? Their possessions are the souls of men. Hallelujah. So Jesus spots them of it. And the Bible says he led them in triumphant procession. Did you see that? Did you see the second event on the cross? And the third event, the three days in the belly of the earth in Ephesians chapter 4. I already explained that already. All these events are connected to Revelation 5. Hallelujah. Because it is because he prevailed in hell that he became worthy to be the one to break the scrolls. To open the scrolls and break the seals. If he did not prevail in that grand battle in the canyons of hell, he would not have been worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. Hallelujah. It seems to me as though that scroll contains the proclamation of our redemption. And I'm going to show you something. Now, Revelation chapter 5, as it were, what we are seeing is that it supplies the missing information of what Jesus went to do in heaven after his resurrection. And I was saying it earlier, that Jesus went to heaven twice. How many of you want to see how Jesus went to heaven twice? You want to see it? The second one, which we are all familiar about, or familiar with, is Acts chapter 1, right? When, after he had spent 40 days with his disciples and showed them a lot of stuff, he now said, I'm going to heaven now, starting in Jerusalem, till you be endured with power from on high. Remember that story? And then the Bible says that it was, he ascended into heaven, and two angels, two witnesses, received him into the sky, and he disappeared from their very eyes. But before that, he had gone to heaven and he came back. How many of you want, want to know how? You've seen it in your Bible, but you, you just didn't pay attention. Let me show you. John chapter 20. Glory to Jesus. John chapter 20. Are you there? Verse 17. Whew. Glory to Jesus. This was in the immediate aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. 
Remember, Mary had rushed to the grave, as it were, to put perfume on the body of Jesus, and she had not found his body. And as she was about to turn away, dejected, to go and say to the people that, I couldn't find my Lord, the Bible says Jesus called her and said, Mary. The moment Jesus called her, she turned and she said, Rabboni, Master. And then she went further as it were to hug him. Kaya Namandis. See, you cannot be more spiritual than Jesus. Jesus used to hug people. Amen? <laughs> Let me just, for some of the brothers. Um, but anyway, if your body cannot hold it, don't hug. Amen? It's you and your God. Hallelujah. But it's not a sign of spirituality to know that. I see me, I'm very spiritual. I don't hug people. They're not spiritual. Jesus hugged people. Amen. You are helping yourself. How did I get into this? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Forgive me. Amen. Forgive me. Just focus on the word. Glory to Jesus. So Jesus, she, Jesus called Mary. And when Mary heard the master's voice, she turned and says, Rabboni, Rabbi, Master. And she went as it were to hug him. And then Jesus said what he said in John 20, 17. Look at it. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father. Kaya. In all of scriptures, this was the first time Jesus referred to God as our own father. Because until he resurrected, he was only Jesus' father. He was not yet our father. But for the first time, he said, I'm going to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So he says, go and tell them that I am ascending. It means that immediately Jesus resurrected, he had to go to heaven to present the blood. Because remember, he said, don't touch me yet because I have not ascended. But later, when he came back and started appearing to them, he allowed Thomas to touch him. So something had changed. That means that he had completed. So what happened was when he resurrected the Kaya. Glory to Jesus. When he resurrected the air and went into heaven was when the narrative in Revelations 5 happened. So what we are reading in Revelations 5 is the missing information of what happened after John 20 verse 7. Interestingly, it's not, I'm just realizing it's the same author that wrote the two books. Hallelujah. Because actually it was only John that actually records this conversation with Mary. And it would be interesting that later on in his life, God was supplying the missing information. And this is very important because even the book of Hebrews already alludes to this. And I'm going to show us something. Now when, you see, we say that the Old Testament, I need to close around this now. Next week we go into the significance of what happened. Now, help me Jesus. Remember that we always say that the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the New Testament. So in Exodus chapter 18, 19, and 20, when what is actually called the Old Testament came into force, the Bible says that Moses killed the lamb, put the blood, half of the blood belonging to the children of Israel, uh, no, he killed the lamb. And the Bible says he sprinkled half of the body of the lamb onto the tabernacle. And he sprinkled the other half unto the children of Israel, bringing them into vital covenant with God. Have you read that before? Go, go read Exodus 17 to 20. You see that there. And it says that these are tabernacles made of hands as an adumbration of the tabernacle in heaven. Also remember that when God was giving Moses dimensions of the tabernacle, he gave him specific dimensions and tells him that this tabernacle was going to mirror the tabernacle in heaven. Did you get the point here? So it means that just the same way, help me Jesus, the same way the earthly tabernacle was purified before Israel could come into covenant with God, Jesus had to carry his blood to the heavenly tabernacle to seal our eternal covenant with God. 
Do you get the point here? And this is not P. Mike's opinion. It's in the Bible. Hebrews. Somebody say Hebrews. Oh, yeah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Glory to Jesus. So, go and read the entire Hebrews 8 and 9 when you get home or after this broadcast. But I'm going to pick about four verses from Hebrews chapter 9 to illustrate what I'm talking about because of our time. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. Are you there? But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building. Do you get the point here? Christ is a priest after a greater tabernacle that was not made with hands. Now look at verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Did you get that? So he carried his blood to that tabernacle to ensure that he obtains eternal redemption for us. Did you get the point? Let's jump to verse, read the entire chapter later. Let's jump to verse 24, 26 to bring it all together. Oh, glory to Jesus. How the Father loves us. Going to this extent to save us. Are you getting the point? Now, somebody might be wondering, hey, should be God is just God. Why couldn't he just declare that we are just forgiven without doing all of this? God is just. Glory to Jesus. If we, God is somebody that when he speaks, that his word, it be, as it were, God is powerless in the face of his word. Did you get my point? Because when God says, I will bless you, he loses capacity to curse you because he respects his word. Do you get the point here? So when, because God has upheld the word by the word of his power, he has to ensure that he does not contradict himself. He has to look for a legal way. Are you getting the point? To bring God back to himself. That's why he had to do all of this. The father is intentional about us. Praise God forevermore. So let's go to 24 to 26 and try to wrap this up. For Christ, are you in verse 24 of Hebrews 9? For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. So he entered into an holy place, but it's not the holy place made with hands. Are you there? Which are the figures of the true, but not in, but into heaven itself. So where Christ carried his blood to was where? Was in heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hallelujah. Not nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others. So it means that this transaction that Christ did, he didn't have to do it every day. He had to do it just once. Are you following the point here? For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he had appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hallelujah. Did you see that? So when Christ resurrected, he carried this blood, hallelujah, into the heavenly tabernacle to establish eternal redemption for us. So it was what happened in that heavenly tabernacle in heaven after the resurrection that we saw play out in Revelation chapter 5. So John was taken to the scene where redemption was confirmed. Are you getting the point? God had to show John so John can know, that, okay, this is what happened. This is where the transaction that confirmed your eternal redemption. See, if you have any claims of ever getting to heaven and being with Jesus, the claims is based on what happened in Revelation 5. That he had prevailed. He had broken the seals. Hallelujah. And he had opened the scroll. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Let me get to a good place so that we can rejoice and close. Go back to Revelation chapter 5. Hallelujah. Those who just love the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Those, you know, when, when, when we have revelatory teaching of the word of God like this, you now see how beautiful the Bible is, right? You now see how beautiful revelation is, how beautiful, how all of these things interplay. Glory to Jesus. So he says, let, let's just go to 5.5, five, Revelation 5.5. Five. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not! Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, 
And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as it had been slain. Did you see that? So Jesus became a lamb that it had been, as it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. Having every one of them harps and golden vows full of holders, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. When the new covenant became established, a new song proceeded out of the heaven. That new song is the song of redemption. Hallelujah. It's the song of our salvation. They sung a new song. Hallelujah. And look at the song. It said, Thou art worthy to take the book. And to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood. Hallelujah. So the sacrifice of Jesus was to redeem us to God by his blood. So we have only one claim is that Christ died. Yes, we are good people. And by spirit, we live right. Amen. We're good people. By spirit, we give to the poor. We do all the good things that we do. But our only claim in the eternal high court of justice is that he died. And that by his blood, he had redeemed us out of every kindred. So it means that this transaction that took place in heaven is the reason why any man born of a woman who believes this gospel can become the redeemed of the Lord. So in whom, that's why Ephesians now makes sense when it says in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus has done, I have been redeemed to God eternally. Notice where we read in the book of Hebrews, it doesn't go into heaven every other year. He did it once. And that one sacrifice was enough. Christ is enough for me. Wherever you're watching from, right here in this hall right now, lift up your right hand and say, Christ is enough for me. 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 He has paid the price for my redemption. I am redeemed from sin and from the curse of the law. In him I have redemption which is the forgiveness of sins. Like I always like to do, if you're sick in your body, I declare, in the name of Jesus, be healed right now. If you need a financial miracle, I declare, receive it right now. Whatever your heart desires in this service, in the name of Jesus, receive it now. Thank you, Father. Oh, Christ is enough for us. Lord, we give you the praise for this beautiful time in the word. Thank you for teaching us and instructing us in righteousness. We receive all that redemption has brought. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you so much for joining us, joining us in service tonight. If you want to give the account details are on the screen right now. See you again next week Sunday. God bless you.